We're beginning a new series today, which we're calling The Attitude of Gratitude. Gratitude, a mindset of being thankful. You know, that's the most positive attitude that you can have. You know, many people keep a tradition of saying what we're thankful for uh, right before we say grace at Thanksgiving dinner. And oftentimes, uh, we're thankful for our health, or we're thankful for our family, we're thankful for the bounty that we have. We're thankful for all the things that we have. But when someone is missing at the table, because they've passed away over the previous year, or if there's not enough food because our business has failed, then in that circumstance of really not having enough, how do we give thanks? You know, we see in the Bible six different times that Jesus prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. It's interesting that five of those six times he was facing just exactly these kind of failure, not enough kind of circumstances. We find Jesus giving thanks in the face of failure, in the face of death, or in the face of not enough. And today, that's what I want to talk about. What we're going to focus on today is, what do we do when there's just not enough? All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men and all of their families. This miracle was memorable because it happened in the face of not enough. Here's how John, the Gospel of John, puts it. The disciples said, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And then it says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people, and they all ate as much as they wanted. That comes from John chapter 6, verses 7 and 11. Not enough, really, is an illusion in three different ways. First of all, it's an illusion that there's not enough time. How many times do we complain that there just isn't enough time to get it all done? Before we know it, it's late in the day, and so much that we thought we could accomplish is still left undone. We read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 35, And when the day was already far gone, his disciples came to him and said, Hey, the hour is now late. Not only is not enough time an illusion, but not enough energy is illusion. Right there with not enough time, not enough energy. We get tired. We get stressed. There's both emotional fatigue as well as physical fatigue. We must remember that the feeding of the 5,000 took place at a time when Jesus himself, in his human nature, was emotionally fatigued. We read from Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. After Jesus heard about the beheading of John, he crossed Lake Galilee to go to some place where he could be alone. But the crowds found out and followed him on foot from the town. So, not enough, an illusion in terms of time, an illusion in terms of energy. And then, thirdly, not enough Money. It's an illusion in terms of money. We always feel the pressure of not enough money, don't we? Uh, again, John chapter 6, verse 7. Even if we worked for months, the disciples said, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Hey, we have some, but never enough, right? Now, why do I call this, in all three cases, the illusion of not enough? Well, because while it appears that there's not enough time, the truth is that we are in the presence of the eternal God. And while it appears there is not enough energy, we still are in the presence of the almighty God and can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. And while it appears there is not enough money, we are in the presence of God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Our problem is that we get our focus on what we don't have rather than on God who has promised, after all, to meet all of our needs. In America, you know, we have really made it our purpose in life to struggle 
for more, to always want more. The wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes in the Bible says it's better to be content with what you have. Otherwise, you will always be struggling for more, and that's like chasing the wind. That comes from Ecclesiastes 4.6. Struggling for more. This morning, I, I want to remind you that the Bible says that when you always want more, when you're always struggling for more, it's going to cause five negative problems in your life. So very quickly, let's talk about the five consequences of always struggling for more, always wanting more. The first consequence is that wanting more, struggling for more, causes fatigue. It just wears you out. The race to get more drives us to overwork. Again, turning to the wisdom literature of the Bible, Proverbs 23, 4. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Restrain yourself. Or here's the second consequence of wanting more, struggling for more. It causes debt. We think that the problem is we don't have enough money, so we go and borrow money. But the real problem isn't that we don't have enough money. The problem is, is that we want too much. And often we confuse need with greed, and they're really not the same thing. They're very different. You don't need everything that you've ever dreamed of. None of us do. Again, Ecclesiastes 5.11, the more you have, the more you spend. And anybody who's ever gotten a raise knows the truth of that, right? Or here's the third consequence of wanting more, struggling for more. It causes worry. Again, Ecclesiastes 5.12, the very next verse. The working man can get a good night's sleep, but the rich man has so much that he stays awake worrying. You know, when you focus on things, you worry. The more you have, the more you have to worry about. You worry about saving it. You worry about investing it. You worry about spending it. You worry about protecting it, maintaining it, polishing it, avoiding taxes on it. And then we see the fourth consequence of wanting more and struggling for more, and that is conflict. You see, when you add debt and fatigue and worry all together, you're going to get conflict. Turning to the wisdom literature of the New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 1 says, Don't you know where these fights and these arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires, the wanting inside you that war within you. And then the fifth consequence of wanting more and struggling for more, it causes dissatisfaction within us. And dissatisfaction is always a result of always wanting more. Again, turning back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. If you love money and wealth, you will never be satisfied with what you have. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Things can cause happiness. I'm not here to say that that's not true. But that's usually only for a very brief time. It doesn't last. The thrill wears off. The fun goes away. No matter how much you're thrilled with getting whatever it is you want, initially, eventually, you either redecorate it or repair it or replace it or at least rearrange it because things don't permanently thrill you. And yet, our culture is all about getting, buying new things. I remember very clearly about 40 years ago when I had first got my very first job out of college as a salesman. My, my boss, after a pretty successful first year, took me to a new car dealership in his new car, and he dropped me off. And he uh, introduced me to his uh, salesperson at the car dealership, and then he left me there. He told me that either I was buying a new car that day for myself or I was walking back to the office. That is the uh, kind of culture that I kind of grew up in, that I matured in. And it is, 
it is very much the culture of discontentment, of always needing more, of always wanting more, of always raising our level of what we have to spend and going into more debt. It certainly was never a matter of how can we be content with what we have. And today, that's really what I want to talk to you about, because over the 40 years since then, I have been working on learning the secret of contentment. What is that secret of contentment? That's what we want to talk about today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says that I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Uh, focus for just a moment on that word learn. Paul says, I have learned. Notice that contentment, and I'm here to testify the truth of this, that contentment is something that you learn. It's not automatic. It is not natural for me or for you to be content. It's not natural. We're not naturally content as human beings. We're naturally actually very discontented. Paul here says that contentment is something that you've got to learn. It's a Christian value that you've got to learn. So how do you do it? How do you learn contentment? Well, the Bible teaches us that there are three things that you have to do to be content. I'm going to call these three things that you have to learn. I'm going to call them three keys to unlock your contentment because I believe with all my heart that God has given you contentment within your heart. If you are a Christ follower, you are, you are someone who has the Holy Spirit within you. So you have the ability to learn contentment. But you have to have, you have to do these three things. There have to be three keys, kind of just like if you uh, have, a, have a device and it has facial recognition. That's one key. And then if you have to use your thumbprint, that is a second key. And then if you have to type your password in, that's a third key. And sometimes you need to do all three things in order to be able to open up your device. Well, in the same way, we have to do all three things that the Bible teaches us to unlock the contentment that God wants to give us. So let's talk about these three keys, all right? Here's, here's the first key. And that is to give thanks for what I have. If I want to learn how to be content in the face of not enough, I have to give thanks for what I have. The key here is to be grateful. We read in the miracle of the fishes and the loaves that the disciples did not have nothing. They had something and Jesus gave thanks for what they had, confident that God would in turn supply their need. So the first step of learned contentment is to appreciate what God has given me already. Because everything that we have, and we do have things, right? Everything that we have is a gift of God if we look at it in the right way. I'm reminded of the old joke where the preacher goes out to see the farmer and the farmer has this beautiful farm, row upon row of, of uh, plowed fields and, and uh, grazing animals and everything is, is in order and everything is just beautiful. And, and the farmer, in showing it off to the preacher, the preacher turns around and says, my how God has richly blessed you. And the farmer thinks about that for a moment and says in turn, well, you're right, preacher. God has blessed me with this, but you should have seen it when God had it all to himself. <laughs> I don't know why. I always find that to be funny. But, you know, it really does speak to our hearts because sometimes we think, well, yes, God has given me some things, but I also have earned some things. You know, I worked hard for this job that I have. I worked hard to get through school, or I worked hard to get this promotion. You may say, I worked for that house. 
I work for the things that I have. Well, I'm not taking anything away from your earnings. But I just want to ask you this question. Where do you think you got the, the energy or the brains or the ability to work? I mean, if you go back far enough, isn't everything that you have, including your energy and your ability and your degree and your education, isn't everything you have a gift from God, including your work, including your effort? I mean, really, you wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for God. It's all a gift. So we're to treat life itself as a gift then treat everything we have, all of our possessions, as gifts of God. Again, turning back to the wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes 5.19, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. You see, this is... This is the attitude that God wants you to have toward your possessions. He wants you to be grateful for them. And he wants you to enjoy them because they are gifts from God. You see, there's two ways to have enough. One way, and this is what we usually think of, is to get more. But there is another way, and that is to want less. Being thankful for what we have, being content in what we have, focuses on the want less and to appreciate what we already have. In fact, if you were to walk away today and say, hey, what did I really learn from this sermon today? Here, I think, is a sermon in a sentence. Happiness is not getting everything you want. Happiness is enjoying everything you already have. God wants you to enjoy what he's already given you. 1 Timothy 6.17 reminds us that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So you want to unlock contentment. You got to have three keys. Here's the first key, and you got to have all three of them. The first key is to give thanks for what you have, to, to be grateful Here's the second key, and you got to have this one too. Give generously from what I have. In other words, the second key is to be generous. God doesn't just bless you with the things that you have for your own benefit, but he says to you, I want you to share it with others. I want you to give it away. Again, let's turn to the example of Jesus here in this story. After taking inventory to see what they had, the two fishes and the five loaves, a very natural inclination would have been to say, wow, that's not much. Let's send everybody away. Let's keep these five loaves and these two fishes for ourselves. But instead, we read from John chapter 6, verse 11, then Jesus took the bread and having given thanks, gave it to those who were seated. And he did the same with the fish, and all ate as much as they wanted. Jesus was thankful for what they had, even though it was small. And also, Jesus was thankful that God would in turn supply all their needs. Paul actually writes about this in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 through 19. Let me read it from the message version for you. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. And if they do that, They'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Now, four quick observations that I'd like to do, use about this 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19 passage. 
as soon as we see, tell those who are rich in this present world, in this world's wealth, we immediately, every single one of us say, well, this doesn't apply to me because I am not rich, right? There's always somebody around that we can point to, that we can think of, who is so much richer than us. And the Bible, we think, must be talking about them. But I want to remind you that here, as being an American, you're automatically richer than most people are around the world. And certainly as being someone who lives in 2021, no matter how poor you are among us, you're richer than the vast majority of the people that has ever lived before this time. So God really is talking to every single one of us. We are literally rich in this world's wealth. The Bible verse here that Paul is talking about says, hey, don't be proud. Don't be focused on your money. Focus rather on God. In fact, it's Jesus who reminds us that you can't serve both. You can't serve both God and money. We're reminded here from Paul's writing to Timothy that God piles on the riches. I love this. Tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches they could ever manage. But notice it's not for our sake It's so that we can be generous in giving away the God-provided wealth. In fact, Paul reminds us in this fourth observation of the end game. We are literally building a treasury in heaven that will last us forever by how we spend our wealth here on earth. We are according to this scripture, gaining real life, a God life, a God generosity. Here is a a truth that when we can learn it can help us so much. Giving, being generous, is the only antidote to the disease of materialism. We have a fancy Bible word that we use for materialism. It's called coveting. It simply means I'm focused on get, 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 get all I can for me. That's that's what materialism is. That's what coveting is. The opposite of getting is giving. And every time I give, in that giving moment, I break the grip of materialism and coveting and getting on my heart. You see, my giving... It, it shows my spiritual maturity. My giving shows the direction of my heart. My generosity reveals what I'm really like inside. So two keys so far here, right? Two keys to being able to be content in the face of what we see is not enough. That first key is to be grateful for what I have. The second key is to be generous with what I have. And now we come to the third key. And remember, you need all three of these. Give attention above what I have. Give attention above what I have. And here we're talking about being godly. I have to be grateful. I have to be generous and I have to be godly. This is about where the focus of our attention is at. Jesus knew that not enough was an illusion because God has promised to meet all of our needs. So the focus of his attention was not on the five loaves and on the two fishes. His attention was rather upon God. We read from Luke chapter 9, verse 16, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread and the fish. Let's focus on that phrase, lifted his face to heaven. Why lift his face to heaven? Because Jesus in that moment was seeing what God would do. He was focusing his attention on what Paul calls the unseen thing. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, from the NIV, reads this way. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, there are really two realities in life. There is the seen world, what we see all about us. That's all the material things, the material world. But then there's also the unseen world, the immaterial world. God, obviously, you you don't see. But here is a vital Christian truth. We should never confuse seen and unseen with real and unreal. You see, the unseen God is more real than the seen material world about us. Nothing you see about you right now, nothing in this material world is going to last. Everything, your cars, your homes, your technology, everything is eventually going to rust and decay, and deteriorate, and fall apart, and wear out, and return to dust. Nothing is going to last. The things that really count in life are the things you can't see, like your relationship to God, or your relationship with other people. This is what lasts. And so this is why Paul writes, fix your attention. In other words, Focus your attention on what is going to last. Give your attention to permanent values. Reorganize your life around eternal priorities because things do not prepare you for eternity. When you stand before God one day at the end of your life, he's not going to ask you how much money did you have in your bank account. He's not going to ask you, how much did you get in life? So right now, while we're living in this life, we should be asking ourselves, hey, where's my primary goal in this life? What is that? Is it just to get more? What do I spend most of my time thinking about? What do I spend most of my time talking about? What do I spend most of my time on Facebook or on Twitter posting about or reading about. What am I living for? Don't ever confuse what you're living on with what you're living for. So what's the secret of contentment? Well, notice this verse from Psalm 17, 15 in the Living Bible. It says, as for me, my contentment is not in wealth, but in seeing God and knowing all is well between us. Find your satisfaction and your security in your relationship to God. Here's our key question today. Will your lifestyle be determined by Christ or will your lifestyle today be determined by culture? I believe that most of you who are watching this have already made that decision And have said, hey, I want to listen to Christ in my life. If so, then you need to take these three steps. You need to unlock the contentment in your heart with these three keys. You need to say, dear God, starting today, I choose to become a more grateful person. Starting today, I choose to become a more generous person. Dear God, starting today, I choose to become a more godly person and focus on what really counts, not on what doesn't count. 